This is a party for uh, one of the Johnson & Johnson family members. They are of Johnson & Johnson. You may not know that some of these people are actually Johnson & family members, so treat everyone as if they are. I always expected that my 21st birthday party would be the greatest night of my life. Champagne, pretty girls. You wonder, can life get any better than this? Well, to be blunt, it can. At midnight, I'm going to inherit more money than most people can earn or spend in a lifetime. I've been waiting for this night for as long as I can remember. The thing is, now that it's here, I'm not really sure what to make of it all. I live in a country that everyone wants to believe is a meritocracy. We want to think that everyone earns what they have. I guess if it makes you feel better, keep telling yourself that. It doesn't work for me anymore. I know my family gives away millions of dollars each year to charity, but how does that exactly level the playing field? I mean, what did I do to earn the kind of money I'll own at midnight tonight? All I did was inherit it. My grandfather Seward was the first generation to be born rich. When he was my age, he bought a schooner and sailed to the Arctic. From the beginning, my grandfather had everything going for him. He went to the best schools, was trained in all the finer arts, and was introduced to all the right people. His father had started from scratch. He founded a company in 1886 that was called Johnson & Johnson. It wasn't long before the Johnson brothers were two of the richest men in America. It sure seemed like my grandfather had an ideal life. If only he'd known then about the trouble ahead. By the end of his days, my grandfather had managed to sink himself and his family into the kind of problems only truly mastered by the very rich. Ugly estate battles, bitter divorces, brutal publicity, and family ties undone by business rivalries. I've heard plenty of stories like my grandfather's, and I have a feeling that I'm not the only rich kid a little worried about the voodoo of inherited wealth. But the thing is, nobody wants to talk about money. It's like this big taboo always lurking under the surface. That's why I want to ask other kids who were born rich about that one subject everybody knows it's not polite to talk about. Look, Jamie, this firm, we have represented your family for years. For years. Uh, I, I can't... I can't in good conscience recommend to the kinds of people you want to talk to about the kinds of things you want to talk about that they participate in the film. They have to be nuts. I mean, you're dealing with families that have always made it gospel that you don't talk about your money. And now you want to put them in a film that... Um, I don't know how... You know, I'm not surprised that you're having trouble getting people. Before I say anything, I, I just want to say that I am really, really reluctant to do this. And I really don't like talking this thing at all. And I dislike you both immensely as a result of the fact.
If Luke is any indication of what it's going to be like trying to get my friends to talk, then this is going to be more of an adventure than I expected. You know, I mean, I have sort of apprehensions, first of all, I, you know, about being on, you know, in a film, like, you know, about a bunch of rich kids. Like, maybe it's more than that. I understand that it represents, like, you know, a particular sort of, you know, niche that maybe, you know, most of the world doesn't really recognize, and in that way it's significant. But, you know, I, I would worry about, like, my parents seeing it, you know. I would worry about um, some of my friends seeing it. I think, you know, some of them would think that my involvement in it was inappropriate. You know, essentially just kind of the notion of talking about, you know, one's wealth, you know, describing a bunch of people's wealth, it's just kind of tacky. My father's in the gaming industry. They do sports and horse racing. They supply the equipment and security and everything. So they do the, you know, all the betting at Belmont and, you know, Churchill Downs is where the Kentucky Derby's held, um, you know, at the Preakness. And then they do all the hotels in Vegas or Atlantic City in terms of sports betting. It's a pretty big business. My father told me at a very early age um, that I could do whatever I wanted. You can do everyone. You can be a concert violinist for all I care. As long as you do something. As long as you do something, you're going to be set up. You don't have to worry about anything. Don't do something. You know, he didn't say, at that age, I might have to cut you off, but... It would be a low estimate, a very low estimate for me to say 20 billion. But I can't, I can't get too exact with it. But in, in, uh, in attainable assets, that's, what, that, that's the range our family's in. My grandfather goes by Psy. His, his father went by SI. I'm my father's oldest son, so I'm SI number four. And my great grandfather had bought a group of magazines under a label called Condé Nast. I don't remember what was in it originally, so I'm just going to name them all. Is that okay? I don't have enough fingers. Vogue, Allure, Vanity Fair, GQ, Self, Glamour, House and Garden, Connie Nast Traveler, Architectural Digest, Bon Appetit, Gourmet, Wired, New Yorker. And I'm sure there's a couple I missed, which in any other family you think would lay a lot of pressure on my shoulders and say, you're, you're the oldest, you know, you're, you're the namesake. But it doesn't work that way in my family. You've got to earn your way. If you don't go to school, at least somewhat, and if you don't work for the family and put in your time, you don't get shit. Hi. Hey. What's that? How are you doing? Very hey? good. You're looking right. great. It's therapeutic. You go to the shrink, you talk about yourself, and then you figure out things. Same thing, you're a tater and you, you still talk about yourself and you figure out other things. It's my shrink. And there are not many people like myself in uh, modeling. I, I see and uh, had friends that really got me into it. They almost coerced me into it. They really, I kept hearing it from many sides. Try it, try it, why not try it? And uh, finally I did. And Lauren, Lauren Hudson, who's a friend of mine, gave me the idea. Isabella, Rossellini once said, ah, yes, I call you know. Some other members of my family think it's uh, a step down uh, being a whore, which uh, for a man, I think it is. I did it purposely. It's the uh, other end of the spectrum for me. I've always been very introspective and uh, interested in uh, culture and things like that. And this is something on the surface completely. And I, I'm purposely doing it to explore that side. No, I'm just going to stand right. Oh, yeah, Bristol Pichy. Okay. Bristol Pichy. Lapels, you see, they're high. There's nothing worse when you see these jackets with these lapels that go like this. You see? They are low riding. Clinton wears this kind of thing. Have you seen? It looks like a restaurant owner. It's so vulgar. This is so... has an aristocratic thing to it, no? Well, I think no matter what I hear about my parents, about my family, no matter what I read, the fact is that I'm absolutely you know, proud to be a Trump. And I'm, you know, like, proud of my family name and I'm proud of everything they've done and ever accomplished. My grandfather, somebody was telling me, had built more housing units than anyone else has ever done in New York. And he was just in the other boroughs. So to my dad, it was sort of, 
he wanted to go in the direction of his father. He just always loved Manhattan, so he wanted to build here. You know, there's some sort of pride in the fact that people would even take an interest in me just because I'm a part of them. So, you know, for a while I was worried that, you know, for my whole life I've sort of be under my parents' shadow, but it's not a bad shadow to be under, I guess, so it's okay. I mean, growing up, everything just seems normal. You go to a museum, you're like, yeah, that's me, that's my family, you know? And don't you have a family museum? The money from my family is kind of complicated. On my grandfather's side of the family, uh, his, his grandmother uh, was Gertrude Vanderbilt. The Vanderbilts made their money in shipping and railroads. And Gertrude Vanderbilt married a guy named Harry Payne Whitney, who was the son of William C. Whitney, who was a very famous New York financier. Gertrude was a bohemian type, kind of going off to Paris and getting sculpture lessons by Rodin. And in the early 1900s, had gone downtown and, and tried to help out a struggling American artist and in the process formed the Whitney Museum. I always take the subway. Like, my mom had never really been on the subway. I took her on the other day and she was like, whoa, this is cool. Other people should do this. I was like, you should come during rush hour, you know? It's kind of ironic because the Whitney family made their money off the subway. Yeah, they, they can, they sort of pri privatize the subway and help a monopoly on it, charge the city all this money. It was a complete racket. They were crooks. But everybody was a crook back then who made money. The Johnsons, right? Yeah. Terrible. They probably were like making opium or something. Or, strange to say that. But growing up in the country, I just thought that everybody had carriages and horses and stuff like that. My parents never sat me down and said, you're rich. In fact, my dad never talked about his inherited wealth at all. That's why it was so weird when I did find out. I was 10 years old. It was in fourth grade, during a free reading period in the library. A kid in my class found my dad's name in a copy of Forbes magazine with a list of the 400 richest people in America. The kid read the article aloud to the whole class and everyone including my teacher ran over to check it all out for themselves. It was strange, all my friends and me finding out at the same time how rich my family was. I felt like I was learning a secret that I wasn't supposed to know. A secret my dad had been keeping from me. And now, the fact that I'm making a film about it has him really nervous. Sometimes prying into people's lives with a ca camera and revealing things that are sensational creates ill will and... Uh, yeah, but I'm almost, I'm kind of, I'm fortunate enough to be in a position where I want to have a happier life and how I actually feel about myself more in a psychological, introspective way. And I don't want to be nervous about money or be nervous about who I am. And I feel like you're feeling nervous about this film is maybe that nervousness of who you are. And you're in control of this film, and I'm not. So there's uh, a little source of nervousness. What do you think about my theory that you have that nervousness and that anxiety that I'm trying to avoid? maybe understand and overcome? Perhaps I do. And maybe you will overcome it. Maybe you can walk into school, into a group of people, feel perfectly at home and comfortable and that you belong. 
or have as much right to be there as anybody else. You think you made a mistake and you don't want me to make the same mistake you did? Maybe. The time I realized I was, I was wealthy was um, act, ironically at Friends Seminary in New York City, which is a Quaker school. I say ironically because people, Quakers are supposed to be nice and like not evil acting. But um, apparently some, you know, there's one of those parent meeting things and some kid, her father must have told her, oh, that, you know, that guy, his family owns a lot of stuff and newspapers and they're really mean and, and whatnot. And, you know, she went and told everybody that I, you know, I thought I was all into myself where, and I don't know, I guess at that point these kids were intelligent enough to think that, you know, that made me a braggart or something. And uh, they beat the crap out of me at a Quaker school. So that, that was uh, my first realization of that. And also allowed me to also realize that I didn't like my father so much because I came home all screwed up and he didn't even notice. So There were times as I grew older that I was, became more conscious of it by the way people treated me because I had money. It wasn't even my money. You know, I was a little kid. It was people, I'd noticed people treating me differently because my parents had money. So that even, you know, one more step removed. So I didn't, I never really understood that. <laughs> because I couldn't give them my parents money. So I didn't really think it was a reason to treat me in a different way. But I think that's why in friends that I have now, the major quality I look for is sincerity. Because there, I think there is a lot of that. And I didn't realize it when I was younger because I was quite sheltered. But, but now I see it, so. I remember, you know, being picked up from school to go on holidays in a limousine, being this huge thing. I remember being so upset with my father when, you know, he would do that. I remember, you know, making him, like, either, like, park around the block and I would, like, scurry down the street and around the corner. And that's a true story. I really did that a couple of times. I remember just, like, being like, no, you know, I'm not rich. I don't have any money. And, you know, like, telling people that. Making an effort to identify with, like, maids working in our house or, like, babysitters or, you know, whoever and trying to convince them like as though there was any like they were living in our house for Christ's sakes you know my dad brought us up always telling us we were poor we never were given too many presents and I didn't know anything about the Vanderbilts or the Whitney's I didn't know anything about it and I remember when I was a little kid my my mom let me spend the day with my uncle and uh... He took me to Grand Central Station, and he said, this is yours. <laughs> I mean, that's just the worst thing. He, he took, <laughs> and he'd just take me all around New York and, and be like, yes, we own this. And he just, it was the dumbest thing in the world to do to a kid. This is something that people, some people in my family did a long time ago. I never knew them. My mom never knew them. My grandfather didn't even know the people who who came up with this idea. I'm not like making money off of Grand Central Station or anything. I didn't grow up like Josiah with statues of my family in front of Grand Central Station. I don't even know that much about how my family started their business and I really don't know anything about how it still runs today. In fact, none of my relatives have worked at Johnson & Johnson since my grandfather's generation. All I know about it is that ever since I was a kid, I've heard this rumor that they have a company store in there where employees can get anything they want for half price. Even though my name's on the package, I'm just a shareholder and a customer, so I pay retail just like everybody else. These are like the new rage, right? Like these glasses. Okay, ready for me to look totally retarded? Because yellow is not my color. We'll go ahead anyway. I'm a handbag guru, personally, because it's like the easiest thing to shop for when you're not really shopping and you're just running in. And you just go and you buy it and you don't realize how expensive it is. And then it kind of adds up and you have like two huge, you know, like shells worth of uh, bags. I think this is so classic. It's just a little bag. You stick everything in. It can hold your makeup kit. It can hold your Palm Pilot or if you're still into paper, your diary. Um, 
And then, of course, you also have the bigger one so you can fit your little dog in it. My dad's German, but he was born here in New York. He went to collegiate and then went to put himself through Columbia and then went to Harvard Law School. He was a lawyer and is like self-employed now. And so I was always raised lap of luxury in New York, totally lucky, going to private schools my entire life and kind of having whatever I want, but always knowing that if you ever lose it all, all you have is this. <laughs> Um, I've, I'm a German Baron and an uh, Italian Viscount. And how does that happen exactly? Well, because my great-grandfather was Kaiser Wilhelm II, and it just means, you know, when you're, you come from an old family, and, you know, hundreds of years ago, you know, you're either related to a royal family or, you know, somebody in your family, like in the Middle Ages, you know, clobbed somebody on the head and the king made you, uh, you know, a bear and a duke or whatever, you know, 800 years ago, a thousand years ago. And then, you know, it's just sort of the way the family's progressed. And it's, it's just a question of, you know, manners and just, it's not, not even that. It's just like, you know, the difference between old money and new money. Right. <laughs> So as you can see, there's not much uh, audience for fencing, aside from the fencers themselves. It's kind of bleak. Do you hang out with the fencing team more than you do with the other? Roger, do I hang out with the fencing team? Yeah, you hang out with the fencing team. I hang out with the fencing team. Everyone's very nice here, because fencing just attracts people who aren't Aaron. that outgoing and don't have that much they need to prove, you know, the guys who don't Come on, shout and scream all the time. Drink. Go Ford! Drink. Call you Ford! All right, Nathaniel! Whoa! Shit. A lot of people who know me know, you know what my financial situation is, and they they do ask me a lot. They, you know, they wonder, why do I stay here on campus? They. You know, they, they think I have something better to go home to, like a mansion or, you know, my apartment off campus or something. And, and I do have a place in the city, my father's place, but it's not fun to go there. And I feel aghast in my own home. So I stay here and I made this place my own and my friends don't always understand that and they have their own idea of what a, how a wealthy person or a person from a wealthy background would live. This is my place. This is in Lloyd at Haverford. It's senior housing. That's a, a Lloyd double, so we have, I have uh, two rooms, uh, mine and my roommates, and we have a suite. And it's nice. I keep all the things I want. We got food stuff, which we're kind of out of, and enough liquor to service at least two people. It's certainly a far cry from what I've got at my father's place in the city, but this is really it for me. This is where I feel safe. And, uh, and feel in control of things. When I go to New York, that just doesn't feel like my life anymore. Okay, this is a room that nobody's probably walked into for the past 10 plus years. It's a little time capsule, if you notice, by the Madonna clock and uh, my interesting attempt at color painting. The homage to Poison and Motley Crue. The 90210 posters. Little, uh, I think they were trading cards that were stickers, and the Bon Jovi sort of wall. This was my bed. It's a little small for me now. <laughs> Probably why I don't stay in here anymore, but yeah. And what floor are we on? We are on the 68th floor. Not a bad view to wake up to. <laughs> Things really changed more when I when I went away to secondary school, went to St. Paul's. I was really into experimenting and different drugs and drinking and so I was just kind of a mess. I was weird. I mean, I, my, some of my friends tell me about how I used to just go off in the woods and climb up to the very top of a tree and sort of make weird noises and scare people. I mean, the first time I tried LSD was the summer between 6th and 7th grade. 
and I look at some of the crap some of my friends were involved in. Like this whole gangster thing that we all went through. Um, like our incredibly precocious drug habits that we just made it, you know, such a point of flaunting to the world. Not that I was against the drug habits. I mean, I was one of the more precocious. These are, you know, two small elite New York private schools and then at St. Paul's there's boarding school, which is just a bastion of historical snobbery. I mean, it's just all there, you know? Have you ever had an encounter that rubs you the wrong way? It's whatever pisses you off. And I'm up at boarding school, and this kid's from like some shit town in Connecticut. You know, I don't know. I can just say, fuck you, I'm from New York. I can buy your family, piss off. And this is petty, and this is weak, and this is very underhanded, but it's so easy, you know? My, my parents had come up to visit me during Parents Weekend of that fall, which sort of coincided with my 18th birthday. And um, my dad brought up all this paperwork, things I had to sign. I had to look over my will, things I'd never thought about before. And this was the time when I was trying to think about college, what I wanted to do after high school. The idea that I was a millionaire, knowing I had was a millionaire, that's kind of a... It's kind of hard to, to, to accept, I think, when you're a kid and you haven't done anything yet, that you have all of this. And while all your, you know, you have other friends who don't, who don't have anything, they just have their little checking account with the money they earn from summer jobs. Put it this way, I'm a multi-millionaire, I have an income in the, in the high six figures minimum per year um, and then I make roughly fifty thousand dollars a year in my current job. The St. Paul's I drove up with the chairman of the board of trustees from there like he was my dad's best friend at the time you know like the second day of school like the headmaster who every student hated because he was such a prick came up to me and personally introduced himself just like things like these you tend to notice you know and then Brown, like, forget about it. Like, I, I mean, I think on some level I got in there on my own merit. I had really good boards. I had really good grades in high school. But that's almost incidental because I feel pretty sure I would have gone there anyways. I attended the entire of my first academic year. I think less than eight academic obligations total. And that includes tests and exams. So including tests and exams, I physically got up and went somewhere for something having to do with class less than eight times. You know, and I get these like, you know, kind of really invasive letters from Dean saying, though you are technically, you know, below the number of credits, you know, required, you know, for continuing education at Brown University, we do feel that with continued academic progress, you will da 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 and da 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 I'm just like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> you guys can't throw me out, can you? Like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> you know, so again, like, Thank you. Great. Phenomenal. I showed up at, at, at Trinity College in, in the fall of 1994 for a couple weeks, and, and, and college is just out of control. I'd had all these problems with depression, and you know, I was quitting the sports teams and sitting around in my room and not really reading the books I was supposed to be reading in school. And my parents came up, and, and we both decided that I was going to take some time off. You know, At first, I thought it was going to be a semester or two, or the whole year. And um, it ended up being about two years, um, probably the best two years of my life, the most important years of my life. One of the jobs I had was working in a in an oil field services company down in Texas. Uh, I was working with Cajuns and Hispanic guys who'd never even been to high school. And here I was, this kid had been to all these fancy boarding schools, and I was an alien to them. And it was hard at first, but uh, I think they also learned some things from me. You know, at lunch, lunch times, they'd always be asking me all these questions and kind of trivia questions they get a kick out of that that I that I knew a lot of these things you know to know what the the capital of 
Chile is or something. In my mind, I, you know, I knew it was Santiago, but I went on a fly fishing trip with my dad down there in the mountains, and I'm going around on helicopters, being, going from pool to pool. Really what I learned is that working hard makes me feel good. When my dad was my age, he thought he'd have a career at Johnson & Johnson. But my grandfather told him he couldn't work there because he didn't want family issues interfering with business. Plus, he knew that my dad would never need to earn a living. I guess at that point, my dad could have just gone on permanent vacation. But for some reason, he didn't. Like my dad, I'll never need to work. And I'm not much of a painter. So I want to ask him what he thinks I should do with my life. After graduation, you might pursue the filming a little bit, but you might also get interested in graduate school, further studies, building a collection of historic documents, papers, publications, As a career? Yes. Okay. Oh, this is a beauty. This is a map. This is one of my favorites. Map of Washington Township. My God. Look at that. And look at the way this little tiny portion of pink down in the lower right corner outlines the lot and the block. I don't know. Here. Collecting old maps seems pretty cool. Yeah. But I don't exactly see where the career part comes into it. Hand colored. Yeah, oh yeah. The bottom line is, I gotta do something. An example of this before? And there are no courses in college about how to be a hard working and productive rich person. It's something you gotta figure out for yourself. Well, considering I don't have to work, what advice would you give me on? <laughs> <laughs> then don't work. <laughs> then don't work. Why would anybody in their right mind work unless they had to? I personally do not believe at all in any moral obligation for anyone. But I've seen that people with money that don't do anything are unhappy. A great philosopher called Schopenhauer says, well, the poor are, are limited by their poverty. It is the duty of the rich to um, cultivate themselves um, in their idle time. And if they use their own riches for this, they can reach the highest elevation. Class has always existed in humankind. You have denied it as a culture. Not to be supercilious and look uh, down from an older culture, but really you're discovering it just now. Well, first I went to Wellesley thinking that I was going to work really hard and I wasn't going to get paid anything because I was going to um, be a doctor. Even though I was having fun the whole time, I was realizing that my credit card bills were mounting in college and I realized, okay, this is not the way for me to be. Why don't I go try investment banking? Got to investment banking, they work you to the ground. The first day I got there was 7 in the morning, they didn't leave it, let us leave till 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, welcome to Merrill Lynch and welcome to uh, working your butt off. But um, I enjoyed it. I learned a lot about finance. I learned uh, certain skills, how to interact with clients. That was my best skill. Like I got handwritten notes from CEOs of companies saying I was great, I was fabulous ever need anything, call them. Um, but I didn't have the drive anymore. Like I saw these people that would just sit there and sit there and sit there and I was like, my friends are at downtown Cipriani right now. It's 10 o'clock at night. They're having bellinis and like I'm sitting here cranking out numbers that are never going to get looked at. And that's where I do the line. I was like, <laughs> I need a normal life. I can be successful between the hours of 9 and 7 or 8 o'clock at night and then go out and have a good time. I went to lunch with my mother. <laughs> that was gonna be like a nice family lunch. Mm. Oh no, okay. Um, uh, <laughs> suddenly, as like I'm about to leave to go to the gym, she's like, "We need to talk." <laughs> I'm like, "Uh oh." She's like, "What are these bills I see on my credit card?" She just wants me to respect what I buy. You know, like that even though we do have like a privilege, and you are in New York, and you are doing all these fabulous things, and famous people wear it. 
um, that at the end of the day you realize not everybody is as lucky to have what we have and to be able to stroll down Madison Avenue and go in and buy a pair of $600 shoes if you really wanted to. A lot of people, you know, that's like unheard of. When I came here, it just shocked me that every, every time you go somewhere, people ask you, when, when you meet someone, the third que second question even is, what do you do right away? Where you live and what do you do? And in Europe that doesn't happen. People find out who you are and what do you do by the way you speak, your intonation, your subject of conversation. So I never really knew what to do because I don't do anything, so I didn't know what to really answer. This is a more rom romantic telephone sort of sensual, it takes a long time, so it has a whole, so you already know you're making this phone call. Whereas this one is, is sort of quick, and sturdy, that's more for business, and each one has a different, you know, connotation. I would have to say I'm rich, or I would just say that very simply, or sometimes I'm kept if I was in a bad mood. And I think it's something that always made me feel good to answer back that way, because it, it would make people understand that it is something that is, make them understand the nature of the question, that it is unpleasant in itself. This is the Ele Britannica 11th edition, which is uh, in 33 volumes, but thin. And, uh, and this is the last edition that was written before it became, from 1911, before it got completely rewritten and became, you know, for the masses. I mean, now the Encyclopedia Britannica is, you know, shit. In my will and wish to for cultivation and culture is, you know, sort of the Dionysian side, love and sex. And so I find it very often that I'm reading a book and I'm thinking about pussy, but then as soon as I get the pussy, I'm thinking about a book. So for me, it is very problematic that. I've sold maybe 15 paintings, and I sold paintings to Denise Rich. I did, I did a portrait for Princess Carol Jordan, Mandalina Theodokopoulos, Alexandra von Furstenberg. Um, I just did one of Alex and Talita von Furstenberg. This one is very sort of basquiage. And what does that say? I will spend the rest of my life trying to live up to ideals I don't think I can. My great-grandfather and my two great-uncles who built the A&P lived in New Jersey. And they really loved New Jersey, and that's where an A&P base is. And the first one was a supermarket or a tea store, and then my two great-uncles decided to make it into a chain supermarket. I think it was the first one, like Woolworth. And so there was 15,000 stores. And um, my father wasn't involved in the A&P. I think he worked for them for a day or something. Then he inherited the A&P the A money, so he bought Hog Island, he named it Paradise Island, and he developed it. Because the art collection was worth, say, 400 million, and the property in LA was worth, let's say, 400, 500 million, right? The island, of course, is worth a couple hundred million, right? And then the museum, so, and then all the houses. So it's say a couple billion. And he lost. And he lost or sold or gave away all that, yeah. I like this picture a lot. My mother's really happy here. This is with President Nixon on Paradise Island. This is a cute picture with the Beatles. Because they, they filmed Help on Paradise Island, so... And actually, this is actually my favorite picture of my parents. I think my mother had given my father a black eye, so he'd had, he'd had to wear sunglasses that day. <laughs> we came back to New York. We were living at the Carlisle Hotel, and I was going to the Hewitt School across the street. I used to eat salami and watch TV and talk to the servants and it took why you know he didn't come downstairs so he came downstairs he came for half an hour and when my mother left him she always says he got him he started to get involved in drugs he went down with a cast of hair to Mexico and he started taking quaaludes. My mother always says that she thinks my father would have been a really simple man had he not inherited the money. Yeah, I've got all this money, and yes, if I wanted to, I could probably go and we could go like downtown and go buy a Ferrari or something. I could do that. Um, I've gotten a little older and more mature, so it's not something I obsess about or think about. 
you know, I've always had, I've, always, I've been able to drive in nice cars and I already have nice houses and my, my family has a lot of nice stuff. I already have that. It doesn't really make me feel good to, to accumulate more. The pleasure extinguishes itself very quickly and I find I use my time and my money to instead do things that I take part of. For example, going to the tailor. So I go there and I break, you know, Rocco's balls for hours because the button has to be just right and, and we talk about the shape of it and the, and the sewing. I mean, yes, it requires money, but it also requires setting down what, what you want, your taste. So it, it gives a meaning. I mean, this time that I spent, yes, I get the great soup, but I don't just buy it off the rack because it exactly reflects what I want. I wouldn't trust myself with a million dollars right now if it was all, you know, ready cash. If it was extremely accessible, I probably wouldn't trust myself with it. Um, give it all to the homeless. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, let's see. I, I, just, I just have a few houses in like the Bahamas and London and animals and playing um, big art studio um, things like that This is our barn, Gotham North. It's actually brand new. I have eight stables here right now. Uh, this is Nadia. She's actually my youngest horse. She's six years old. We just bought her um, this year from Europe. This is Julius. He's a little crazy sometimes, but you know, <laughs> we like him anyway. This is Caristella. Um, I do her in the high amateurs, and she's gonna be a great horse. Having the last name Bloomberg sucks. <laughs> I remember when he actually started, like first started campaigning, um, and I won a big class in May um, at a horse show, and a few in, a few people from different magazines wanted to interview me. I sat down, and the first question they asked me was about my father, and I realized that second how it was going to be, and it's, it has been like that, and that's really what my struggle is, is to have people see the person behind that name. I don't really know exactly what they see me doing in the future. My sister is kind of the business one in the family like she I think that she will go to law school and become you know the prized daughter um, which I think she is already we're very different and we do different things that make us happy and I don't really care who accepts what I do or the way I act it's, I'm doing what I love to do and, you know it doesn't really matter to me what the hell they think Guilt to me is idiotic. I've, I've always found guilt to be the absolutely the, something that has been taught us by a terrible culture of uh, um, a sort of a, a Christian Puritan culture where you were supposed to atone for some initial sin. And I, and I find guilt absolutely senseless. So I don't, I don't, uh, I don't feel bad for any, for any thing and uh, especially having money I find it a very very negative trip and it's something that is you know uh, basically for for uh, old women and nuns yeah. well, I remember once my father and I were walking down Fifth Avenue and there was a homeless person sitting um, sitting right outside of Trump Tower and I think I was probably maybe nine, nine, ten, something like this. It was around the same time as the divorce and I remember my father pointing to him and saying you know that guy has eight billion dollars more than me because he was in such extreme debt at that point you know and um, and me thinking what are you you know what are you talking about he's he was sitting outside of Trump Tower and I'm looking and I'm going you know, and I didn't understand, and sort of, and I think I just thought about it maybe like a year or two ago, and I, you know, I found it interesting. You know, it makes me all the more proud of my parents. They got through that. The heliport is right up here somewhere, and, um, yeah, my parents use it all the time. My parents have a helicopter, which is really fun. 
And um, they take it to and from the city when they go, usually. And if I'm smart, I figure out when they're going, and I can get either a ride in or a ride out. But then I have to take a, <laughs> a car like everyone else. <laughs> My dad's an amazing person, and he is famous, and I'm aware of that, and I recognize it. But I always feel like, oh, he's a golfer. No one's going to know who he is because he's a golfer, and that's like a, a different world. But then everyone's like, of course we know who he is. What are you talking about? Um, and fortunately for him, he was good enough to turn pro and make it on his own on golf and not have to have a college degree. But he sort of went from nothing and made it into everything, which was very admirable. <laughs> Corporation of Southampton, and this is where lots of people come to bathe, and eat lunch, and sit on the beach. And I've been there all afternoon, and now I'm going to give you guys a tour of Southampton. Now we're going on to Main Street of Southampton. I am not a big shopper myself. I sort of go into Saks because my parents forgot that they still gave me my charge card, so that's the one store that I can buy clothes in where I don't have to pay for them, and it gets charged to them, which is amazing. This is the Meadow Club. This is where the tennis, all the tennis is played here. It's only a tennis club. Um, but you can probably play like squash and that kind of thing. Racket club, if you will. This is uh, extremely, extremely, like, waspiest of wasps. <laughs> but it's beautiful, as you can see. All the courts are grass. You have to wear all white to even be here. Is he a member? Well, he's probably a pro. I brought three four Jewish friends to the Bathing Corporation today for lunch. And it's fine. I mean, <laughs> actually, I don't know. That was the first time I've ever brought anyone, so who knows, I may get kicked out tomorrow. But I think it was fine. <laughs> I think the people at the club would probably not be that excited if someone came in with a black person. Especially someone, not that I have any problem with it, please. But especially being that my parents, for example, are relatively new to a, the club or to all of this in general. So, like, we're already on sort of, like, watch, you know? <laughs> like, everyone already sort of, like, is speculating on, like, what we might do wrong, I feel like. When you go out in Southampton, you definitely will go to Conscience Point. There are everybody from New Yorkers to, you know, famous DJs to Puff Daddy, you know, having his party there. I will come in at about 7 o'clock and, and do the table seating for the night of what party, how important are they, where are they going to be seated in the club. Obviously, attractive women is going to help you because that, that looks good for us. You know, we want to see Cristal Champagne sitting on the table because there are other people that are in the crowd that will want to ultimately emulate that. Good to see you, dude. Nice to see you. Well, the nightlife in the Hamptons is about as despicable as it gets. You know, the, the fact that we all go out there, you know, we all go out there to relax, enjoy ourselves, maybe play some tennis, sit out on the lawn, go out to the beach. And then we find ourselves in these places which are even worse than the clubs in New York at night. You go out there, and there's Joey and Tommy and Billy and Maddie. And you met Joey and Tommy. You know, they're all unzunting and, you know, they're all doing their thing and, it, like, it's just so gross. I mean, I just don't understand why we can't just go out there and have people at one another's houses and sit back and we can get drunk, we can do lots of drugs, we can be decadent, we just don't need to do it with Joey and Tommy, you know? We have a two-bottle minimum per table. Our cheapest bottle is uh, $250 a bottle. And champagne prices go all the way up to... A magnum of, of Cristal would be $900. The standard night is to go out with maybe like 10 or 12 people. We get two tables, and each table gets two bottles. So each table would be about like $800, which is extremely expensive, you know? You're sitting there like, you know, why am I doing this? Why am I spending $800? I could be so many other things. Like, I could go to Europe. I could, you know, 
go to the Bahamas, I could buy a pair of pants. But <laughs> the barbell's that big, you know. I don't remember the evening all that clearly, but what I've definitely it? spent, you know, several thousand dollars on a barbell, probably. You know, these things happen. Everybody who started going out in tenth grade is still going out, and. Nobody from New York is new. Maybe somebody from Europe or somebody from L.A. or somebody from Chicago, but nobody from New York that I can think of is new. Like, you never would have heard of them. They all went to private school, and they all, you know, you would have hung out with them at some point in time. They all know each other, and it's, um, and that, and that is their dating pool, and I would say it's pretty much limited to that, to that circle. I've never actually dated outside my social background, and I've thought about that. Never. It's really weird. Um, I never really thought about it. I think it's just like your compatibility, you know, somebody on your, your same wavelength, like understanding everything where you've come from. I'm sure I would, you know, but he'd have to understand the fact that, you know, I love going shopping somewhere and you know, spending all this money on something and I'm sure some guy might get mad at me for being stupid and spending all this money for like a Gucci purse and he'd be like, what are you doing, you know? But of course I'm like, oh, I have to have it, you know? I think it'd probably be weird to, t to bring someone to your, to your homes, um, to your summer house or, or maybe to introduce them to your parents uh, or something like that. And or just you know, or when the, when you introduce them to your parents and their parents are asking them about where they live and you know my parents are they're so you know they live in this world where they might be like so where do you summer or something like that or <laughs> it's such a unique situation we're in at the end of the day I mean really there are so few people with whom we could actually share this kind of stuff in common that it ends up being a subject of conversation quite a bit because you can't really relate to any of it. And it's not to say that like, we need to pour our hearts out about it, you know? But, you know, I mean, pouring your heart out about it feels good, you know? Talk about it makes you feel good. Now, how to internalize it makes it feel good. Everything about it feels good, so, I mean, you know, it's not, it's not, as, you know, it's not, it's not to say that we need to, you know, we need a shoulder to cry on. Not at all. The point is it ends up being something we talk about a lot because we're so alone in the circumstance. Growing up and going to Chapin and seeing my friends that got divorced, you know, the parents definitely, they just forgot about the kids and just fought over the money themselves, you know, and, and how is the wife going to take care of herself if she gets so low of an amount and how is she going to take care of the kids and she wants the plane and, you know, he's going to take the plane and who gets the house in the country and... You know, in terms of marriage, anybody's going to have to have a prenuptial agreement these days. And I know that sounds really bad, but you just have to. I was going to school one day, and there was, I saw in one of the news boxes, a huge picture of um, both my parents. And there was a rip down the center of the picture. And this was before I had officially been told that they were getting divorced. And I came out of school that day, and there was a swarm of photographers and paparazzi and all these things waiting to ask me questions. And I mean, it was, I wanted to stay in school because I wanted to have a normal day and do all this, but it makes it that much more difficult to deal with your own personal emotions and to think about, you know, your family and your brothers and what they're going through, knowing that you're going to walk out of the building and there's going to be a r bunch of people running after you asking you, difficult questions. I have no intention of being loyal to any woman anytime soon or not that I probably ever will be but one day I'll fall in love and I'll get married whatever I'll probably get divorced a couple of years later I'll have a serious prenup before I um... prenup it's been drilled into my head since I was five years old prenup all the way and if this little ungrateful bitch has the nerve to say something like it's unromantic, I don't want to bring up, then she's just a gold digger and I don't want to get married to her anyways. I guess it's a little strange to be thinking about divorce before you even know if you're going to get married. But I've seen what can happen if you don't think like that. When my grandfather was 73, he left my grandmother and married the upstairs maid. If they'd lived happily ever after, things would have been great. 
but it didn't work out that way. At the end of his life, sick with cancer, he was medicated and manipulated into changing his will again and again. After he died, the court battle over the fortune he wanted to leave to charity destroyed his reputation, tore apart my entire family, and made his third wife one of the richest women in the world. My dad never really got over the whole thing. For a guy who thought it was impolite to talk about money in the first place, having the whole mess discussed in the New York Times every day was a total nightmare. I was too young to read the papers, but I could sense the tension at home, and I knew one thing I definitely didn't want to inherit was that fear of talking about money. I know you don't like talking about money. When I was little, you always told me it was a bad idea to talk about it, and I shouldn't, and I shouldn't. And if anything, I should lie if people ask me. And I just want to know, what are you so scared of? Well, perhaps I was mistaken. I mean, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> what are you talking about? You were mistaken. That's bullshit. You were mistaken money, for 20 years of my life? No, money is a thing that you don't talk about because it's in bad taste. Why? Bring it up. It's it's really not no, important. You never examine it. You'll never really understand it. You won't be able to solve any of the issues or resolve any of the well, problems. I'm not so sure this thing's a good idea. I think rich people are actually pretty confused these days. They don't know how they're supposed to feel about themselves because they've been getting so many different images. You know, that you see wealth is this cool thing. People strutting around in expensive clothing means something, but at the same time, you see a lot of shows that are trying to, on TV, they're trying to make it seem like the everyday middle class family is where the real life is, where, where happiness exists. I think that a lot of kids that, that grow up in, with money or, or some sort of affluent lifestyle, they, 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 that, that that lifestyle can sort of, it, it, it really holds them back. Um, from discovering their passions and 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 what really makes them feel good and about life. I remember once I was on a job in Australia, and um, and this guy just walks up to me. I was at you know I was at some you know like after celebrating party. It was fashion shows there, um, and this man walks up to me who I'd never met and says. How does what does it feel like to be wealthy? And I, was, and I was like, excuse me. And he goes, what does it feel like to never have felt any pain? And that really upset me. Not because I was upset for myself, but because I was upset for him. Like I was bothered by the fact that he could be so ignorant, and like that there are people out there who could like say such a blanketed thing and just be so downright stupid and just you know not use the brain that they have. And that's what bothered me. Not the fact that he could make like. You know, not the fact that anything he said really, you know, wounded me deep down, just the fact that there really are people out there who think like that. You know, that think that with money comes, comes happiness. Do you ever worry about getting cut out of your family's yes. wheel or your company? Yes. I'm extremely paranoid. I'm, ex I'm paranoid all the time that suddenly, like the next fax from my grandfather or the next phone calls to me, you know, I'm really disappointed in you because you wore the wrong pair of shoes the other day, so, uh... No, you're on your own. Have fun. Sure, big time. It scares the hell out of me. It's it's you know it's regrettable. There's there are enormous number of things I really, really count on. The absence of which would bring about a lot of emotional distress, maybe even intellectual distress. What do you think? What would you do if like some, you lost all your money tomorrow morning? I don't know. It's it's kind of like, well, I'm not going to compare it to that, but it it, it is in the same way, like the idea of losing a parent or a sibling. This is something you don't really like to think about. Maybe some people do. Maybe some people can handle the, psycholo handle the prospect psychologically of either of these two losses occurring. And, and they can actually foresee themselves. I, you know, I don't think I can really think about it until it actually happened. You face a lot of different pressures from having money when you win. It's as a if a professional got to win, especially worked hard and you wrote it well. As an amateur, some people will see that, 
that you rode well or you worked hard for that, but there will always be the people that said that you won because you had the nice horse. I could use it as an excuse to not come and not work, but I've kind of swapped that and made it be an encouragement and incentive to come and work even harder, kind of prove people wrong. I think it can actually give you more drive, but a lot of times that's turned towards revenge, like showing up your family, like saying, you know, I told you so, look what I can do. That's why you see sometimes, you know, wealthy kids turn to drugs or you know, hang out with really whack job people because they want to shock their family. They want to show that they can escape from the mold that their family all seems to be a part of. I mean, personally, the way I'm going about that is because I plan to actually graduate college and go to graduate school and, you know, and fucking, you know, thumb my nose up at them with a Ph.D. in something. That's it. I mean, that's my little form of revenge. I, rather than getting Barbie dolls, I used to get upset. I always wanted Legos or like Erector sets or something like this. So I love like looking at the New York skyline and being able to figure out like what I'm going to add to that and you know, what patch of like sky, you know, maybe one of my buildings will be in. So I've basically always wanted to go into real estate development. It's in the blood, I guess. <laughs> I want to be indispensable. That's, that's my primary objective. I mean, whatever I do, I want to be as indispensable as I can. Now, <laughs> that's a little vague. Probably like a lawyer or in business, is my guess. From the beginning, Luke had doubts about being involved in this movie. In fact, most of the kids I interviewed were pretty nervous after talking on camera. In some ways, you really want to talk about it. But even still, you're never quite sure how the rest of the world is going to judge you for what you say. When the gossip columns finally found out I was making this movie, that put an end to the interviewing. Some of the kids really started to panic. Luke took it the farthest. He hired a lawyer and sued me for defaming his character. Maybe I should have seen this coming. It's not like I wasn't warned. The defendant, Jamie Johnson, sheepishly, surreptitiously, and in the vein of irrelevancy, whatever the hell that means, flashed a document in front of the plaintiff, Luke Wheel, indicating that the plaintiff Luke Wheel's signature on said document was a prerequisite to the plaintiff's effectuation of the interview to be used in this project, and that said executed document was an irrelevant formality that needed to be used. Uh, what, what I guess they are saying, um, but i got to tell you that I consider it irrelevant, is they're trying to make it seem as if Wheel didn't really know what he was signing when he signed something. Uh, all of this stuff about sheepishly and surreptitiously. They're, they're trying to make it seem like, oh, Luke, by the way, I mean, you, you have to sign this thing, but it's, it's nothing. Um, and the irony here is that Luke, uh, who clearly uh, can't afford to uh, try to deal with his problems this way, is suing you. And he can afford to sue you. And uh, very likely he will play this thing out uh, for all it's worth. Uh, it's worth much, but it's, it's, it's uh, sort of the irony of making a film about wealthy people that their very wealth allows them to come back and, and sue you if they become unhappy with what it is that you've done. The judge threw Luke's lawsuit out of court, and my lawyer says everything's okay. The whole thing was pretty depressing while it lasted, but everyone's telling me that getting sued for the first time is a serious rite of passage for a rich kid. I was always told that the American dream is about getting a bigger and better life than your parents had. But that dream was accomplished by my great-grandfather. So I live outside the American dream. And now it's my job 
to build a meaningful life apart from all this privilege I've inherited. I've learned that part of coming of age is finding something that's your own and not your family's legacy. I've had the benefit of being rich all my life, and I'll never want for material things. But after working on this movie, I've discovered that what you inherit may not be as valuable as what you earn. And although I still haven't found all the answers, at least now I know how important it is to ask the questions. Oh